You are listening to the Anxiety Podcast, where we support you to overcome anxiety and reduce stress. We will get vulnerable and it will be real. Here's your host, Tim J.P. Collins. Hello and welcome to the Anxiety Podcast. Hopefully you are suitably intrigued by the title of this week's episode. You should be. It's an interesting one, so stick around. I will also go into a more elaborate disclaimer for you in a moment about the language which may be used in this episode. Before I do that, I did get feedback from a few people that they couldn't see the first 25 to 30 episodes of the Anxiety Podcast in iTunes, which is a travesty. So I've been uh, in the background and fixed that and changed some some hosting stuff. So now you can see all the episodes. They're all there for you. So check them out. Any problems, send me a message. Give me some feedback. Whilst you are also on anxietypodcast.com, you can get my free resources. If you haven't got them yet, help yourself. They're there waiting for you. There's also information about my online course. You can find out more about that there. And if you want to speak to me directly, find out about coaching, jump on the phone and start overcoming your anxiety, then just click on the coaching tab, have a little read through, see if it's something which resonates with you. And if it is, you can book a call to speak to me directly. Okay, so I'm going to introduce this week's guest to you. Before I do so, as you may have noticed from the title to this podcast, there's going to be some profanity in this one. So if you are offended or upset by said profanity, then maybe skip this episode. If you don't mind, then keep fucking listening. Um, This week I'm interviewing Mark Manson. He's a blogger, an author, an entrepreneur. He specializes in writing personal development, um, as he says, that doesn't suck. His website, markmanson.net, is read by over 2 million people each month. Um, So he's just got some, some great insights he kind of started in the anxiety world as well so he he understands our space and some of the stuff we're dealing with um and we'll be talking about his latest book which is coming out uh it's available now for pre-order but it's coming out officially in one week's time and it's called the subtle art of not giving a fuck so there i've said it i've started as uh, and it will continue so uh here we go let's introduce mark Okay, so Mark Manson, welcome to the Anxiety Podcast. It's good to be here, Tim. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, So we're going to get on to talking about your new book that's coming out um, in September. Is that right? Yeah, September 13th. Cool. And uh, we will obviously, as always, provide links to where people can find that in the show notes. But I think we should build up to a bit of a crescendo and and talk about the book a bit later on. And maybe to start with, um, we'd... We'd love to get to know Mark a little bit better. So probably some people listening to this know who you are because you've got a pretty famous blog out there. But um, maybe we could go even further back and talk about your own experience with anxiety and then kind of move through um, to, to what you're up to today. Sure. Um, so actually, I mean, I, you could almost say like my anxiety is a big reason that I'm here today. So uh, I'm a blogger and an author, and I, I write about personal development, psychology, um, personal growth, these types of topics. And um, I actually I kind of got started because um, in my late teens and early 20s, uh, I suffered from a bit of social anxiety and also a lot of anxiety around like intimate relationships. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I got way into kind of, I dived into the self-help wormhole and started reading tons of books and doing all sorts of practices and looked up research and, and things like that. And it was, um, it was a big issue for me for a while, but I was able to over the course of a few years and a a lot of work, um, get over it and, um, kind of move on. But it's, it's funny because at the time in my, when I was about 24, 25, um, I really wanted to start an internet business because it would allow me to to travel and live around the world. And um, I started a few different projects, but the one that took off was the one that involved. Um, initially, it was dating and a big component of dating advice. Um, it relates to anxiety, dealing with anxiety. Mm-hmm. And um, 
And so it became a big part of my work. And then later I kind of expanded out just to deal with life issues in general. And so, uh, anxiety is a constant, uh, companion mm-hmm. <laughs> with pretty much, I mean, it's funny. Like you could, there's pretty much any life problem you could throw out there. There's like anxiety is some component of it. Like it pops up in some form or another. Mm. Yeah. I was just talking to somebody this morning and we were chatting about the imposter complex, um, which no doubt you're well versed in, but I was speaking to them and they were saying, how do I fix this? And I was like, I think part of the realization is you don't. And yeah. you, you just accept that everybody has this and you kind of pick it up and tuck it under your arm and get on with it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, and that's kind of the the feeling I get from reading some of your writing around this stuff is that, um, and I always talk about embracing or acceptance of it as opposed to resistance, because we know that fighting anxiety is, uh, is a losing battle basically. Yeah. It's I so much of it. I mean, one, one of the big kind of realizations for, for me was realizing that anxiety is kind of, it's an effect. It's not a cause Mm -hmm. in a lot of cases. Like it's, it's a result of expectations. It's a result of like assumptions that I've made about a situation. And, um, I think that's true and, and probably, uh, a very, very large percentage of cases, you know, in the imposter syndrome, it's, it's, like you said, there's kind of this false assumption that everybody else knows what they're doing and everybody else knows is like feels confident and secure in their and what they're working on or their expertise or whatever. And the truth is, is that nobody is completely confident and secure in what they're doing. Everybody has these doubts. Everybody's freaking out mm. sometimes, you know, and and just that simple realization, like bringing that expectation kind of back down to earth. Um, and be very liberating in a lot of ways. Yeah. Yeah. And that's kind of, I mean, what we'll, what we'll get on to talk about with the book and, uh, not giving a fuck. There you go. I said it first, um, (laughs) (laughs) or break the ice. Yes. Um, but yeah, it's the same thing. Like we're so embroiled in caring about what people think about us, uh, and externally in the world. And I, sometimes kind of picture humans walking around and we're all in our own heads thinking about the same stuff. Whereas in, and, and so much so that we don't even really notice the other people who are yeah. also worried about what does everybody think about me? You know? Yeah. I, uh, one of my favorite quotes ever that I've ever read in my life, um, it comes from David Foster Wallace and he wrote, uh, he said, you'll stop worrying so much what people think about you when you realize how seldom they do. And on the surface, it's a very kind of, it sounds like a very pessimistic kind of depressing quote. Like Mm. everybody's just very selfish and nobody cares about you. But I remember reading, I read that in my early twenties and it was like a bomb went off in my head. I was like, Oh my God. Like, you know, when I'm at a, at a party or a networking event and I'm like freaking out that, you know, I, I need to meet people, but I don't know how. And you know, People are going to think I'm a loser or whatever. Like everybody else in the room is busy thinking the same thing, (laughs) you know, like nobody, like everybody's caught up in their own little world in their own, in their own head, like thinking that everybody else is focused on them. But Mm. the the fact is everybody's just equally focused on themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that, I mean, we, we know that anxiety isn't rational anyway, but um, continuing to consider that. And one of the, one of the beautiful things that happened to me, and I've talked about this on the podcast before, but as a result of my anxious story and panic attacks and subsequent recovery and stuff, but, um, I now have this and I'm, I would love to hear about what your experience is through your writing, because obviously you're very vulnerable in your writing. So because my story is public and I tell people about it, and if I meet somebody in the supermarket and they're like, what do you do? And I say, well, I help people with anxiety and I talk about it and et cetera. Um, that opens the door for these conversations where people tell me all of their shit. Um, yeah. people tell me what's going on for them. And what that's allowed me to do is realize that everybody struggles. And it's like, yeah. <laughs> before I never knew that cause I never, I never showed any chinks in my armor, but now I'm like, yep, all this stuff happened. And 
and uh, I'm moving on, people are like, well, actually, I've got a problem with this, or I've got a problem with my relationship, or I've got a problem with my body image, or, you know, it just yeah. all, it all comes out. And that's, that's a blessing from sharing is that you realize that everybody's got something going on. Yeah, for sure. So do you see that in your kind of from people who read your stuff and, and get back to you? Oh yeah. It, and it's, um, it's funny too, because, um, you know, like I have a, I have a, like a little, like a video, a small video course on my site and for for anxiety to help people with anxiety. And, and sometimes I get complaints from people where they're like, well, is this going to help my, you know, my anxiety at work with my boss, you know? And because it's so broad, like it's, it's, the principles are the same that there's, you know, there's an irrational assumption. Um, there's very often like some sort of like past trauma or like some past like awful experience. Um, and then there's a process of progressive desensitization that needs mm -hmm. to happen. And, um, and this applies to everything, whether the anxiety is, is, you know, around relationships, around social interactions, around, uh, food and body image or, or whatever. Um, and it's, it's really, it's, there's just, it's almost like there's just a few circuits in the brain that, that kind of behave the same way. It's just for every single person because everybody's life experience is so different. Um, for some reason that circuit gets kind of like broken or reshaped, mm -hmm. uh, in different areas of people's lives. So yeah, it's, it's almost, um, you know, it's, it's, it's just this underlying pattern, but the way it plays out in different people's lives is usually, it's completely different sometimes. Yeah. Which is also a problem because a lot of people I come across think that they're totally unique and one of a kind. And obviously they are in a lovely way. Um, yes, of course. We're, we're all, all snowflakes. Yeah. We're all special. <laughs> Um, but anxiety isn't special. It's non, you know, it's just looking for a different situation to attach itself to ultimately. Yeah. yeah. Um, I want, I read something, uh, yesterday when I was doing a bit of research for this and it was talking about how you went from your desk job to being an author and being a writer. And, and there was obviously no doubt some anxiety involved in making that entrepreneurial leap. So I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that. It's funny. I have, um, I, I have an article, um, about quitting my day job and starting my business. And I actually, I talk about one of my biggest lessons from that experience was like leveraging terror, <laughs> like mm -hmm. leveraging, like I talked about how, uh, when I quit my job and I was like, yeah, you know, when I was like miserable at my day job and like, I hate this, I'm going to start a business. I think I could like get this off the ground and start making some good money. Like it all sounded great. Like while mm. I was at the day job. And then as soon as I quit, like I woke up that first day and just completely panicked and was like, my God, what am I doing with my life? Mm. And, um, burn the ships like the Vikings, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. And, um, but the, the funny thing was, is, is I just, I decided I was like, well, if I'm going to, if I have to be terrified, I might as well be terrified working like <laughs> instead of, you know, just sitting around in my room wondering what I'm doing with my life. And, and I think over the course of that, I, I, that, that anxiety, like I, I was able to leverage that to, um, mm. to just work like a madman and, um, just push, try things over and over and over. Cause it, it's almost like the a situation where, uh, you know, if, when I was trying out business ideas and, and most of them failed, uh, that fear of failure kind of disappeared because it was like, you know, I'm already like, like it can't really get any worse. Like I'm broke. I'm sleeping on my friend's couch. Um, you know, the only, the only thing that can get worse is I have to like go back to my day job or like mm -hmm. go ask my parents for money. And like, that's awful. So if it's going to be awful, I might as well be trying as long as I possibly can and try every single thing I can possibly try. So it was this weird situation where, uh, because the fear was there anyway, um, I didn't have this, like this fear of, you know, trying to be perfect or do the right thing all the time. It was mm -hmm. just like, you know, it's like, it's all terrifying. So I might as well just try whatever I can do. Yeah. 
almost uh, in a liberating way because it gave you the freedom to you know you're sleeping yeah. on the, sleeping on somebody's couch and it's kind of like uh it makes me think of like stoicism and I don't know Tim Ferriss talks about he does a week once in a while where he'll wear the same clothes every day and eat rice and beans and just so he knows what it feels like to be poor. Um, but it gives you that grounding of like, is this what I feared? Is this the worst yeah. case scenario? Sounds a bit it, like that. There, there was a, there's, there's definitely a value of being in a situation where, where you kind of have nothing to lose. And um, it's funny. I've met a lot of entrepreneurs and people starting out who are starting out in a different phase of their life. Uh, you know, they're, they're in their thirties or forties. They have a family. Sometimes they have like a mortgage. Uh, and I, I have a hard time relating to them. Like I, I see that I'm like, wow, I had a huge advantage because I started when I literally had nothing. And so I had nothing to lose. There was nothing. If I spent a year trying to start a business, um, and I failed miserably at it, um, I would just go from being a broke, unemployed 24 year old to a broke, unemployed 25 year old. You know, there was no, <laughs> there, there was like no really serious repercussions. I, I wasn't trying to feed a kid or, yeah. I didn't, you know, have a, have a wife. And, um, so I was very, very lucky in that, in that situation. And I definitely f- feel that like the fear actually benefited me to a large degree. Like I've never worked so hard on something in my life before. Mm. And I attribute a lot of that to the, to the anxiety, to the, um, yeah, just to the, kind of the panic. Channel your panic. Yes. That's a good title for an article. There you go. That one's on me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, and I think that, you know, that is the difference between, you know, somebody who gets the, the freeze, whether you just stay stuck versus if you can use it for, you know, if you can use it for momentum and to mm. actually make you do something. I think it's Parkinson's law, which seems to affect me quite a lot where I, defer, 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 procrastinate. And then I've eventually like, Oh, this is due tomorrow, Better do it now. And I (laughs) I eventually write something or create something really good because I have time pressure. I have a bit of fear in there. Like, Oh, what if I mess this up and don't get it done on the deadline? And then you, you kind of get it done. So yeah, it sounds like you kind of channeled that into creating something really good. Yeah. And I, I think, I think people forget or, or maybe they just, it's kind of obvious, but I think a lot of people don't think about it is that fear is useful. Like fear evolved for a reason. Like fear is there to help us. Um, you know, it back in the caveman days, fears, fear prevented us from, you know, getting eaten by lions and, Mm. um, screwing up the village and killing the whole tribe. And, um, so it's there for a reason. Like it's, it's a warning sign. It's a, it's a sign that like you need, to do something or, or something needs to change. And that's very useful. The problem with fear is that when it, it comes up in to an irrational, like a, an extreme degree, or when it comes up in situations that it just doesn't make sense, you know, like something as simple as like, uh, calling your, your father and like asking him to, to send you money or something like if you or like calling your father and just saying hello or telling him, telling him that you love him, you know, like if that is like Mm -hmm. creates a a monumental amount of anxiety that you literally don't talk to a family member for like 10 years, you know, then that is, that's definitely something that is irrational and it's hurting your life. But yeah, you know, the fear when you start a business, I think it's totally healthy and reasonable, reasonable and, and, and therefore useful in many situations. Yeah. And, uh, you know, to, um, kind of further agree with what you said, um, I think, you know, people talk about fear with public speaking and I believe me, I had a meltdown on stage before, so I'm totally familiar with that. But, um, subsequently I believe that so many people have the pregame jitters or anxiety before they talk, um, even if it's professional public speakers or whatever. Um, and, I, th- I kind of think like if you didn't have any, f- in the absence of any anxiety, it would probably mean that you didn't actually care very much. Right. Um, so if right. you don't care about the audience or you don't care about your message or you're not passionate about what you're talking about then, and you have no anxiety, then maybe you shouldn't be there because it means yeah. you don't care what people think. Um, and I think what you're saying is the same thing. Like, and, and, I, and I've said before, like fear is a barometer of significance. Yes. So if you're doing something which is meaningful as in starting a business 
you know, securing your future livelihood and you've got a bit of anxiety involved, then yeah, that's, that's not a bad place to be. That's a good way to put it. And, and you could even make the argument that if you're, if you're becoming extremely anxious in situations where it doesn't make sense, it's probably because you're putting an undue amount of significance, you mm-hmm. know? And I look back at my social anxiety when I was younger and I think a large percentage of it was directly, you could directly attribute it to, I just cared way, way, way too much what mm. people around me thought yeah. about, about me. And, um, as soon as I kind of like let go of that and got comfortable with the idea of, you know, it, it doesn't matter if some people don't like you, it doesn't matter if, you know, you have an awkward conversation, like these things are just part of life. Like once I kind of was able to internalize that through experience, um, a lot of that anxiety kind of solved itself because I realized, you know, mm. if, if you go into a party and you talk to five people and they don't really think you're that cool of a guy or the conversations are boring, like that's not the end of the world. That's not a, like a life changing event. And, yeah. um, uh, but when you're, you know, when as like a 18, 19 year old nerdy guy who had spent pretty much his entire adolescence in front of a computer screen, like that was a huge event that was like massively mm. life changing. So uh, I like that, like tying it to the significance. Yeah, for sure. And I think that, um, you know, as we talked about earlier, like people just uh, are so in their own heads, they don't recognize. And that's why, you know, this this podcast is useful because um, all the stuff we talk about, somebody who is in their early 20s finds it and listens to it and they're like, oh, yeah, maybe I am placing too much significance on what people think about me because actually they're not even paying attention. Yeah, in a good way, which is kind of freeing. And as I, um, one of the things that I found useful to reflect on, and I don't know who said this or where I heard it from, but like, you know, in might have been James Altier or Derek Sivers or one of those types of people that I read or listen to, but um, it was something along the lines of like, in a thousand years, nobody will even know who we were. Like they were, yeah. like I don't know who my great great grandfather is. Yeah. So yeah. the mistake you make with a girl at the bar, like it's so insignificant. And actually, actually the, the real people like it when you get it wrong. That's what yeah. you come to learn is people <laughs> like it when you fuck it up. They're like, Oh my God, I thought Mark Manson was like this untouchable bulletproof superstar, but actually he's a normal guy. Yeah. He made a mistake. And it- and it, and, it, and it just it gets even better if you if you're able to admit that mistake if you're able to be like wow I said something really stupid like people are like hey it's okay man hey come here give me a hug like yeah. <laughs> like people it it brings out the best in people when when we see that kind of like uh, that vulnerability yeah because like you said with the tribal thing we just want to be loved right we yeah. just, we just want a hug that's <laughs> why that's hug, why the, the superstars <laughs> who have meltdowns like the you know the famous people who have meltdowns or the sports people who crumble under pressure people gravitate towards that and they they you know virtually hug them and embrace them as a community and that's why a lot of times uh, you know america being the famous for the the land of second chances for people right but it's because people are like well they've they're human they made a mistake now i like them more because i used to think they were perfect yeah yeah great example of that in some cases <laughs> it depends who <laughs> yeah maybe not always but yeah a lot of the time um yeah, yeah and, I, and i think like one of the uh i have i had dave asprey of uh, bulletproof fame on uh a few weeks ago and and one of the distinctions he made which i just think is f- fantastic for people listening is he kind of like talked about the difference between um, I, again, this ties back to what you said about self-preservation as humans without anxiety, we would have died out as a species, but he yeah. said his quote was like, I can feel the symptoms in my chest. I just don't believe them when they tell me to die or tell me that I'm going to die. Right. Yeah. Um, so it's like, and I think that's the, the evolution of anxiety for me. Now I'm like, Oh, I'm just about to do something significant, meaning that's good. It's significant. I feel this feeling in my stomach, but I know that it's not the end right right exactly um, and and when you were talking about public speaking earlier like that was the first thing that came to my head because i used to get incredibly anxious giving talks years and years ago and 
um, at this point, it's it's funny. The anxiety is still there. The exact same anxiety. It's just my reaction to it is completely different now. It's like mm. now it, I have a very calm and accepting reaction to it. Uh, mm. like, just like you said, it's like I sit backstage and I'm just like, yep, about to speak again. This is what happens. And Part you just go process. with it. Yeah. And I, I've done like talks on this before, but like, in, you know, you go people who are, end up being successful speakers are people who feel that and then they turn that into excitement and energy and exuberance and all these no. great you know things that you can you know mark manson on stage where you have some adrenaline through and you running through your veins is way more interesting than mark manson who looks totally chilled out and isn't yeah. doesn't care like it's yeah night absolutely day. um before we move on from the social stuff, I wouldn't mind talking about that a little bit um, if you have, because that's clearly something which you had quite a lot of experience in. So what are, for people out there, and if we if we want to talk about it from a, a male specific point of view, but if people out there are struggling to engage in conversations with the opposite sex and kind of get out there and, and meet people, what are some tips that you would give them? I generally recommend an approach. I mean, one thing I notice with people who have, uh, particularly in the dating arena, people who have a lot of anxiety in terms of like meeting people, mm. it's, <laughs> there's kind of, there's two problems that are, I guess, exaggerating that level of fear. Uh, because like public speaking, it's normal. Like it's normal to get nervous when you talk to an attractive person. It's normal to get nervous before a date. Like, that's a healthy fear. Um, when it gets unhealthy is when it turns into this like huge, huge deal that consumes you. And with people that it consumes, I've noticed that there's kind of two things going on. One is they're just, they're not, there's not many options. Um, and this isn't to say that these are just unattractive people because actually a lot of people who get really, really anxious about dating, are very attractive and interesting and have a lot going for them. It's just that they don't put themselves in a situation or an environment where there's a lot of opportunities. So, um, you know, taking that first step and like si signing up on a dating website or something or getting on Tinder or, um, it, getting a friend to introduce you to a bunch of people. Like it, it, if you have like a steady flow of options coming in, suddenly, there's not all this pressure to, you know, that one person you get a date with that year, you have to put like all of your eggs in that basket and be like, Oh, this is it. This is my one chance. You know, like that's just going to drive you insane. And it's unrealistic because it's, it, it, you shouldn't, you, you shouldn't have that, put that, those sorts of expectations on a person you just met. Um, cause you don't know who they are. You don't know them. Um, so that's the first thing I think everybody just needs to kind of like, take a step back and, and think of the numbers, uh, be a little bit more like conscious of, of playing the numbers game and, and putting a little bit more focus on that. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and then once you meet somebody that you kind of click with, then start investing in, um, if that's going to go anywhere. Uh, the second thing is I, and that, by the way, just to interrupt for a second, but that applies to everything in life. If you're going for a one job versus three job interviews, yeah. if you have three streams of income versus one, you know, nine to five, then of course there's going to be more pressure on those single points of failure. Right. Yeah, exactly. It's, you um, you know, it's, it's like diversifying your, your financial investments. You know, you don't want to put all your money into like one stock. Yeah. Um, you want to put it into a bunch of different things so that you can, uh, adapt more easily to what happens, uh, in the world. The same thing is true with your emotions. You know, you don't want to put, uh, you know, until you've known somebody for a long time, you don't want to put all of your emotional investment into a single person. Like you want to, you want to wait and make sure that like, it's a good investment that things are going to grow and become more valuable. Um, the other issue that I see all the time is, and this is just true. Again, this is just kind of like a typical tendency of people who suffer from anxiety is that, um, they, they try to, they try to go A to Z like immediately. Um, 
so the, again, their expectations get skewed. And I think it, it, this is caused by already having some anxiety, but then it just makes the anxiety way worse. So in the context of dating, this is like, I used to talk to guys who, uh, would, they would literally like say, meet a woman on an online dating site and trade like two or three emails. And they would start analyzing, uh, whether her values were compatible with the children they wanted to have. And like, Mm. well, she is actually originally from Canada. And so I don't know how the visa situation is going to work. And it's like, dude, calm down. Like you haven't even been on a date yet and taking it one step at a time, like just start simple, start with let's have a conversation and see how that goes before making any sort of judgments or this is like, major decisions about like your lifelong future or lifelong potential, you know, start with that first conversation, see how it goes. Mm. Uh, and that just relieves so much pressure because then, then there's actually there's, and there's no like necessarily like, like good or bad outcome. It's like, if you have a conversation and the conversation goes really poorly, it's like, Oh, well I don't have to worry about visas and I don't have to worry about, her values and I don't have to worry about this or that, you know, it's like start with the conversation. If that goes well, then, you know, go on a second date, mm-hmm. see how that goes. And then if that goes well, then you can start getting into like, all right, how compatible are we? Like just go A to B, B to C, C to D and try to like limit your brain from making too many judgments or uh, assumptions about, about future occurrences. And again, this, you could apply this to jobs and career decisions. You could apply Mm -hmm. this to raising children. You could apply it to a million different things. Yeah. I always think of like, um, not being attached to the outcome as a, as a nice way to describe it. And, uh, again, it applies to not just relationships, but everything. If you, kind of squeeze your in in the ice hockey analogy of squeezing your stick too hard. But if you, if you need to know what's going to happen in five years time, then it's kind of, it's disrupting the enjoyment that you could be having today. Yeah. And, and an argument I make in, in my new book, I have a, I have a whole chapter based on, uh, I have a chapter called, um, why I'm wrong about everything. And so are you. And, um, or I think it's the other way, why you're wrong about everything, but so am I. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, I just kind of, I dive into like one of the, the the biggest kind of most profound realizations for me when I started digging really deep into like psycho psychological research and, um, understanding like our brain and our biases and how our memories form and how we remember certain things. Um, the more you dig into the psychology of all this stuff, the more you realize that our brains are totally flawed. We have, we're horrible at making predictions. We're horrible at making predictions about our own happiness or unhappiness. Um, we're also terrible at remembering things clearly. And we're also terrible at remembering our own happiness or unhappiness. And, uh, the, like when people discover this, a lot of people that I write about this, this type of thing on my site and I get a lot of emails of people who kind of get freaked out. They're like, Oh, well, if, if we don't actually know anything, like <laughs> what the hell are we supposed to do? And um, to me, it's a very liberating thing because if you take, just take that example of that, that guy who's trying to score a date and he's like constantly worrying about, you know, whether this woman is going to be compatible with him in five years from now. And, and mm. um, you know, what does this mean? Does this mean that, uh, if they get married, it's not going to work out in the long run, or if they have children, you know, and it's, the thing is, is like, you don't even know what you want five years from now. Like you, your brain, all the assumptions your brain is making are incredibly flawed and just poorly informed. And so that vision you have for that relationship you want to have five years from now is probably not very accurate in the first place. You don't know if it'll actually make you happy. You don't know if that's what success actually looks like. Mm. And once you accept that, that you just don't know, then it kind of forces you to deal with the present. Like you said, like it forces you to just be like, Oh, well, I guess I'll just go on a date and see how it goes because that's, that's all you're left with. (laughs) You know, like that's all you can really know is what's happening uh, right in front of you in that moment. Yeah, I think uh, 
That's very well said. Um, I know I, I read one of your other articles, which I think is one of your popular ones, but it's, it's titled Stop Trying to Be Happy. Yeah. Um, so I think that probably speaks to similar stuff, right? Yeah, it's this idea that um, it, it, there's kind of a weird paradox in that when you try to chase happiness, um, it the the act of chasing itself makes you unhappy. Mm. If that makes sense, um, you know, it's it's you could even flip that around and kind of apply it to fear. If you're trying to avoid fear, um, the simple act of avoiding it will cause you even more anxiety and more fear. Mm -hmm. Um, and so really the only way kind of the proper uh, approach to managing our emotions, whether it's positive emotions or negative emotions is to just simply inhabit them, just simply accept them as they arise because none of them last. Good emotions mm. don't last. Bad emotions don't last. And so it's really developing this like internal skill of recognizing them, experiencing them, accepting them, and then letting them go. Mm. Um, it's, it's almost like a, a Buddhist type concept, but it's, um, I, I, it's actually psychologically healthy. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I use, uh, I use uh, something with my clients and listeners, which is, uh, I call the three C's, um, which kind of talk to, you know, some of what you're talking about at the moment, the three C's stand for, um, curiosity, courage, and compassion. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is kind of how I w- encourage people to interpret their anxiety. So curiosity being what's this feeling, where's it coming from? Is there a reason for it? You know, what is it? Where is it in my body? What's it doing? And just to kind of recognize it instead of turning away from it. Um, courage being prepared to kind of sit there and actually feel it. So not to try and avoid it or run away or, you know, forget about it. Because as I learned the hard way, the things that I tried the hardest to forget were the ones which showed up the most. Yeah. Um, and then compassion, because as you no doubt know, people who are sensitive or anxiety sufferers are massively hard on themselves. Yeah. Um, and so it's kind of like the three C's are just a reminder to work through that process, which I think is totally in line with what you said. Yeah. What yeah, you, I like what that. You, what you resist persists is, is something you quoted, uh, in one of your articles, right? Yeah. It's a popular saying from, I believe it's Buddhist mm-hmm. originally. And, um, but yeah, it's, it's absolutely true. And I, I like the compassion thing a lot too, because what, what I used to notice with a lot of, people who struggled with dating and relationships is anxiety is it's often it it often accompanies a kind of, I don't want to say selfishness, but like people usually get anxious around things or situations where it's like they want something for themselves. Like they, and so in dating it's most anxiety stems from people who really want somebody to like them. They want to be loved. They want to be validated. They want to feel sexy. They want to feel important. And what I used to try to kind of explain to people is like, you know, if you're constantly approaching dating in terms of like getting something like Mm. getting validation from other people, um, this is just, it's going to backfire. I mean, obviously we all want love, but like, this is not, you don't start with like demanding love with every person you go on a date on a much better way is to approach it in terms of like, who are they? What are they about? Kind of the curiosity you were talking about, but like what are her needs or what are, what are his needs? Um, are those needs that mesh well with my own? Yes. Um, and kind of leading with that compassion of like trying to understand who the person that you're meeting is what they want, who they are. Um, and then once you feel like you have like a decent understanding of that, then ask the question, will this get me what I want? Will this mesh well with what I'm looking for? Um, and it's, it's funny because like leading with that compassion often, um, it, it eased a lot of like the, the anxiety and the worrying that a lot of people have, like it helped Mm -hmm. them like stop trying to control, um, 
like every date or interaction, you know, it's like mm. they, they stop like, cause it, it, it starts flipping all these things, like all these mindsets around. So, you know, so you, you take like the person who's like, Oh, how do I get this guy to call me back? He won't, he won't respond to my texts. Like give me the line that will get him to like respond to me. Um, that comes from like a very anxious and self-serving mindset. But when you approach it from a mindset of compassion, you just kind of realize like, Oh, well, he's not responding to me because it's, this isn't working out for him. And that's, that's okay. Like Mm -hmm. I can appreciate that. And it's probably better that things end, you know, instead of trying to force something. Um, and so it can, it can lead to like some very radical shifts. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, (laughs) And unfortunately, the way it goes in life is the things that uh, the people who are least connected to the outcome are the most attractive, whether that yeah. is whether that is, again, relationship or whether it's a business you're trying to buy or a job you're trying to get. If you don't give a fuck, which is kind of what we're talking about today, um, <laughs> I don't swear a lot on my podcast that so people are raising eyebrows, but that's OK. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, if you don't care, then and you don't need it and people are going to be more attracted to you, pay you more money and you'll have more opportunities. That's just the way it goes because th- there's a huge power in not being attached. Um, but I think the other thing that you said, which I love is, is so on point is stop making it all about you. Yeah. Right. Get out of your own head. Um, and this again comes to the public speaking analogy, but somebody gave me some advice, which was like, go on stage as though somebody in the audience needs to hear your message. Stop worrying about whether you are, you're sweating or your heart's beating fast or you feel like crap. Realize that if you share your message with, and you can impact one person watching or listening to this. And I applied the same thing when I was nervous when I first started the podcast. Um, you know, now fast forward a year later and I get messages from people saying how it's changed their lives. And so if I never got over that myself and made it all about me, I, yeah. it, it wouldn't have had the impact. So I think absolutely a hundred percent on point with what you said is if you if you look to serve, look to support, look to give to other people. Um, and you know, if you do that, then you, you, you're less in your own head about what's up with me and more about how you can help them. And, and guess what? If you help somebody else, it also helps you. Well, and, and that's, it's funny cause I've never thought about it this way, but I mean, that's a, that's actually a very accurate approach or like a very realistic approach to public speaking, which is you're never in any audience you speak to. I mean, even if you get up there and just nail it and kill it, like, you're never going to have a hundred percent of the people love what you're saying. Like there's always going to be people in the audience who are bored or uninterested and, and it has nothing to do with you. You know, maybe they're having a bad day. Maybe they're, mm. they didn't, they didn't sleep well last night. And you're always going to have a, a percentage of the audience that loves whatever you say. And, and so it's, um, again, it's, it comes back to kind of these irrational expectations in that I think, and I see this in myself too. It's, you know, when I, when I get really nervous or anxious about a public speaking gig, a lot of times I have this, this all or nothing mindset in my head is like, Oh, either the audience is going to love me or the audience is going to hate me. And, mm-hmm. and the truth is, is that pretty much no matter like what I do or how good my talk is, there's going to be, you know, 30 or 40 pe- percent of the people are going to love it or 30 or 40 percent percent of the people are going to hate it at the same time. Mm. And so it's really nice to just remind yourself that it's like, okay, no matter what happens, you're there. There's, you're there for the, like, like this, this guy who gave you advice said, like you're there for the people who need to hear you. And if the other 80% of the audience is bored or doesn't like it, you know what? That's worth it. It's fine. Cause you're, you're changing the life of 20% of the audience or 10% of the audience. And like, that's still worth it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I watched the, uh, I watched the Tony Robbins thing on Netflix the other day and, um, whatever you think about Tony Robbins, he changes people's lives. Right. And and I'm sure like, you know, some of the people in the audience, it shifted their whole trajectory of their life. Other people were like, yeah, this is amazing. I'm going to do it. And then they didn't do it. Like they didn't put it into action. And other people walked away thinking, well, he can do that because he's six foot six and he's a multimillionaire and they just didn't buy it. 
right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you probably got more people in his audience who are actually going to be affected by it because they kind of know what they're signing up for. Um, but yeah, that's it. I mean, you know, if you, if you did a speech to a hundred people today and in five years time, some guy came up to you and said, I saw you speak five years ago. And since then I've lost 50 pounds, started a business, got a family, regained my comp. Like that would be enough, wouldn't it? Yeah, it'd be worth it. Even if the other 99 hated you and thought you sucked, you yeah. know, like <laughs> that, that would be worth it. Yeah. Well, you must experience some of this yourself because if, you know, go to markmanson.net and read articles, but what the, your style of writing is quite polarizing. Oh yeah. In that you use language, you use, you know, very, I mean, you, you are polarizing in the way you write. Yeah. So I'm sure you must get, you know, lots of messages from people saying I really connect and resonate and other people saying you're a psycho. What are you talking about? Yeah. It's uh, I joke with my wife sometimes that like I could write, I could like, publish my grocery list and I'd probably get a hundred people telling me <laughs> that I'm brilliant and a hundred people telling me that I'm a total idiot and like should never write again. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> like it's, it's, it's reached the, it's kind of reached that point. You know, like a lot of times people will ask me, I mean, re- they'll ask me, they'll like, you know, your audience is so big these days. Like, does that intimidate you? Do you get worried? And it's funny. It's actually kind of the opposite. Um, it, because you, you just, the numbers are so large that it just doesn't even feel real anymore. It's it's mm. cause it is true. It's like whatever article I write a hundred people are going to tell me it's the most brilliant thing they have ever read. And a hundred people are going to tell me that I'm a, a moron and that I should, you know, jump off a bridge or something. And, wow. um, and it, yeah, it just stops kind of meaning anything at a certain point. And, it, and it's in a very weird way, this popularity has, uh, it's kind of forced me to get back to, really kind of writing a, like getting back to what inspires me individually, mm. like, um, because it's, you know, once you pass a certain point, like it, if you try to please everybody, like it's just, it's impossible. It's never going to happen. Mm-hmm. So you, you just have to be who you are and say what you, what say, what's important to you, say what matters to you. Otherwise it's just going to eat you alive. Mm. I heard somebody say something like that once, which was like, you should write whatever you're going to write, irrespective of the feedback you think you may or may not get yeah. and, and, and kind of stay aligned that way. But, um, I've also heard people say to me, and maybe it's just a way of justifying the haters, but, um, I've also heard people say like, when you start getting hate mail, it means you're actually getting somewhere. Yeah. I, I you know, 30 years ago, I might not have agreed with that, but um, you know, it's the internet, man. Like yeah. <laughs> people, people will rip on you for anything. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and subscribe it, to your newsletter. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. Man. Um, it, it's so if, yeah, if you're getting, if you're getting hate mail, it means, it means that people are paying attention. It means your message is getting out there. Uh, yeah. and people are seeing it. There's a good example. Who's running for president at the moment. Exactly. Polarize that. <laughs> <laughs> um what, what what at what point in the evolution of your blog did you did you know that you were onto something Um I things really really blew up for me in 2013 and I started blogging in 2007 and then I started kind of taking it seriously in like 2010 mm. Um so and then 2013 things really exploded and it was around that time that I, I kind of shifted like all my old stuff was mostly like dating relationship related. Mm. Um, and then around 2012, 2013, I started shifting more in, into looking at kind of like culture in general. Um, and then I kind of became disillusioned with a lot of the, the s- conventional self help and personal development material out there. And so I, I started kind of taking this a little bit contrarian approach to some things. Mm. Um, and that's, that's really when the audience started to explode. Um, there was, I think there was a very, very large demand primarily among like the younger generation who, um, wanted to improve themselves, but they kind of, they were very sick of this, like, Oliana positivity all the time message. 
Mm. Uh, it felt unrealistic to them. It felt, it felt kind of bullshitty for them. And I think I struck a chord because I was still talking about improving yourself, but I was talking about it in like a very like kind of gritty and and realistic way that, you know, like life sucks sometimes. And, Mm. you know, that's just like how it goes. And we need to learn how to deal with it. Like it's, we are limited. We are fallible. Um, sometimes no matter how hard you try, you don't achieve your dreams and that's okay. Like you need to get used to that. And, uh, it doesn't mean you shouldn't try. It doesn't mean you shouldn't still strive for things. It, it just means that, um, we need to get more comfortable with, um, with just how kind of shitty things can be sometimes. And, a lot of people that makes them very uncomfortable to like think about that or talk about that. But, um, apparently with a lot of people like that really struck a chord, especially I think after, you know, with the like nine 11 and the economy crashing in 2008 and all the stuff that this generation has seen. Um, I think it, it really, it's like struck a chord with people and it, and it's what I believe very strongly. So, um, so yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I think, um, part of it is, is that, you know, you were telling the truth yeah. <laughs> and people gravitate towards the truth. Cause I, I mean, I've, I've, I have to turn off Facebook periodically because I just see so many of these messages where it's like, get up and believe in yourself and shoot for the stars and you'll make six figures a month. And it's like, well, hang on a minute. Um, yeah. and then you look at stories like yours and it took you depending on which, which, um, kind of date start date you look at it took you three to six years to start having big success um and uh that you know uh, there's a great yeah, and, and, and i mean then there's half a dozen projects and businesses that that i tried to start and i failed at and um and the thing is is even though i am like quote unquote successful big successful whatever now um there's still days i wake up and i'm like i don't like doing what I'm doing or there's parts of my job that I still hate. And there's like, and there's still anxiety like that imposter syndrome, or there's, there's another anxiety that pops up a lot of for me the last year, which is like, what if I've peaked? Like, Mm. what if like 2014, 2015 was like peak Mark Manson and it's all downhill from there. Yeah. Um, like it's just classic it never, though. You never win. <laughs> like, always... Yeah. You never win. And, and it's, it's funny. I talk about this in, in the beginning of, of my book is I say, I say that problems never go away. Like you're never going to have a life without problems. Problems just get upgraded. They get solved and they get upgraded. Like there's never a, a problem free life. And, uh, the argument I make is that, is that happiness actually, it comes from, solving and improving upon our problems. Um, it, and if you avoid your problems, um, or if you don't take responsibility for your problems, then you're just going to be stuck. And, um, and unfortunately I, I feel that on a lot of aspects of our culture and a number of aspects of the, the self-help industry, uh, whether intentionally or unintentionally, they encourage people to avoid problems rather than solving them, avoid them through, you know, kind of delusional beliefs or irrational expectations or just kind of like flat out narcissism. Um, Mm. and, uh, and so I, I think it's very important for us as a culture to get back to becoming comfortable and, and open and transparent about our own flaws and limitations and, and accepting of those because otherwise you get, you get shit like Trump. <laughs> yeah. That's what happens. Um, so I wanted to get on to the book and, uh, I don't know whether it, it makes sense when I was reading up on the, the subtle art of not giving a fuck, uh, a counterintuitive approach to living a good life. Um, one of your articles, I think it was from 2013, um, back when you were still good, <laughs> when you were still yeah. on the way up. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I liked in that article, you had three subtleties. So is it, is it worth going through those three and then we can kind of expand on that? Sure. Okay. So subtlety number one is, and again, excuse the language. I'd never really feel comfortable with this. Not giving a fuck does not mean being indifferent. It means being comfortable with being different. Yep. Yeah. And this is a big issue. Um, 
so when I wrote the article and also when I wrote the book, it's, I love the title. I think it's hilarious. Um, it's very like my style is very irreverent. It's very kind of in your face. Um, and I like to use, I mean, basically the, the whole idea of not giving a fuck, it's actually, it's a tool I use. It's like a, a word, a linguistic tool I use to just basically get people to think about what they care about. What, what do they care about? What are they choosing to find important? Mm. Um, what is significant to them? And then perhaps maybe they should choose something else. Um, because like what we were talking about with the anxiety, um, that it comes, comes along with what you find significant. Um, if you're, if you're continually finding anxiety in areas of your life where it doesn't make sense to have anxiety in those places, um, it may be that your values are out of whack, that you're really caring way too much about Mm. something that doesn't deserve to be cared about that much. And so that's where the idea of like not giving a fuck comes in. It's a, I, I joke throughout the book that it's the most important skill you can learn, learn in life is to choose where you place your fucks and, mm. uh, because you have a limited amount. And, um, so the first, you know, it, to, to get into all that, the first thing you kind of have to do is, is dispel with everybody's kind of immediate understanding of not giving a fuck. And that is of this like too cool, indifferent guy who like doesn't care what happens and is like too cool to care about anything. And, um, the truth is that, you know, that may, that may like look cool in like cheesy movies or cartoons, but like in real life, it's people who are indifferent. It's, they're actually not indifferent. They're just protecting themselves. They're hiding their values. They're hiding what they care about. Um, because they're afraid they're mm-hmm. anxious. Um, and actually one of the, uh, I've written on my site before, like one of a very common defense mechanism uh, to anxiety and fear is, is indifference is convincing yourself that you're indifferent or you're bored or you don't care when actually you do. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that's, that's the first subtlety is just kind of just get out of the way. Like, okay, indifference is actually, it's not cool. It doesn't, it doesn't work. Uh, You know, we all have to, we all have to care about something. We have to give a fuck about something. Yeah. Except for Tim. Tim, yes. doesn't, Tim doesn't give a fuck. Tim, Tim doesn't give a fuck, but anyway. <laughs> well named. Uh, for, for people listening, if when you're on the Mark Manson website, if you look at the, I'll link to the Not Giving a Fuck article, but there's a picture on there saying everyone just wants to be liked and accepted except for Tim. Um, so I will link that and you can have a look. All right, moving on to um, subtlety number two is to not give a fuck about adversity. You must first give a fuck about something more important than adversity. Yeah. So this is, this kind of lays out one of the core themes of the book, which it comes back to this whole chasing happiness thing, uh, which is people's starting assumption um, in their life is often just like, I want to feel good. I want to be happy. I want to be successful. I want to feel great all the time. And that's a very innocent and understandable desire. I think we all want to feel good all the time. We all want to be happy all the time. Um, but the truth is, is that it, it just, life doesn't work that way. Um, as I explained later in the book and I, it, and I said earlier, is like problems never go away. There's always problems. There's always struggles. Um, and so instead of trying to avoid your struggles, you should choose which struggles you think are worthwhile. And so mm-hmm. that's what this subtlety means is that, um, you can't feel good all the time. There's going to be problems. There's going to be unexpected issues. So you need, what's most important is choose choosing something in your life that you care so much about that you're willing to struggle for it. Mm. And I mean, you can, you can even, you can even apply this to anxiety. It's like, it's, uh, if you choose something more important, than whatever makes you anxious. It's like what we were talking about with the public speaking. It's like, if you knew that one person in that audience, you were, you were about to change their life. Like that's way more important than how you feel at that moment. That's way more important than you being nervous or like mm-hmm. if people clap for you or if, uh, or even if you get invited back or get a bad review, like that changing that person's life is way more important than that. And so yeah. that once you care about that and prioritize that, um, 
interestingly, like the anxiety, a lot of the anxiety goes away or like it, it becomes much easier to manage. Mm. Which is in line with not making it about us for sure. And uh, yeah. it's interesting because at the moment, me in my, in my little life, I'm just about to embark on some, a bit of a nomadic experience, which I think you've done in the past. Uh, I'm going to travel with my family for a bit and, uh, and still kind of podcast and coach and stuff on the road, but just, I've, I've always wanted to travel and I kept deferring it. And eventually I was like, let's just go now and we'll, we'll just work around it. Right. Yeah. Um, but interestingly, and this may be back to salty one about, um, being comfortable with, with being different is that a lot of the people I talk to about it, they're like, Oh, where are you going? And, and how long are you going to stay there? And I'm like, I don't know. Like I booked the first place and then yeah. if we like it, we'll stay longer. If we don't, we'll move on. And that seems to like, that seems to freak everybody else out apart from me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, uh, you know, you can book a house and you can rent it and it's fine. And they're like, that's irresponsible. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's a reflection of them feeling uncomfortable with it more than yeah. anything. Right. It's totally. interesting. Yeah. It, it, Cause it's something they can't imagine for themselves. And so it's, it's much easier to just, you know, judge you, <laughs> yeah, yeah. which is fine. Uh, I got broad shoulders. Um, <laughs> Subtlety number three, we all have a limited number of fucks to give. Pay attention where and who you give them to. Yes. So this comes from the fact that, uh, I mean, both in terms of common sense, but also a lot of psychological research shows that, um, you know, we have a limited amount of attention and focus that we're able to give, like mental focus, um, we have a limited amount of time in our lives. We have a limited amount of energy each day. Um, so in a sense, our fucks are finite. You cannot care about everything equally. It's no. just, it's just psychologically not possible. And so that, that forces us to start prioritizing certain things over others. Um, and that prioritization is probably, uh, one of like one of the most important things you can do in your life is, is like being aware of that prioritization and being able to change it. Um, and so that's essentially what the rest of the book is about. Yeah. Which is, to, I mean, I feel this so much in my own life because, uh, you know, working on from a, an entrepreneurial pursuit point of view, I started working on the anxiety stuff and then people are like, Oh, you should expand into stress and you should do businesses and you should do this and that. And I, I, don't, I don't know why, but the, the best advice I ever got was just to focus on one thing and, yeah. and, and really build this community and build support for these people. And as a result of sticking to that and, uh, and avoiding my natural, you know, tendency to shiny penny syndrome and start a different project and do something else. This is one of those ones where I've just been laser focused and, and it's, it's paying off. The message is getting out. More people are listening. The word is yeah. spreading, but it wouldn't have spread if I started saying, well, I do, you know, I dabble in anxiety. I also do a little bit of stress and a little bit of time management and a little bit of procrastination. No, because people want to be drawn to something where they have an affinity with it. Um, yeah. and, and, I just, I don't, I wouldn't have the energy to do multiple things, you know? Well, and the funny thing is, is if you dive deep enough into anxiety, I mean, we've touched all those topics just on this podcast. Like, yeah, it's, you know, maybe your full focus isn't on stress or procrastination, but it's, um, it all pulls back in. Yeah. Yeah. Those, they're absolutely interrelated to anxiety. Like they're all kind of part of the same network of, uh, <laughs> of, problems or neuroses yeah well i think as you've said a couple of times like it's all tied together um, yeah. even the traveling thing like all of these things would i do that if i was anxious and afraid of scarcity and finances well no i wouldn't um so it's taken some work to get to a place where i'm prepared to be a bit more you know footloose and fancy free you know yeah yeah um very cool well there's one other question i want to ask you um I came across, I saw your, on your book, you have a quote from, uh, Derek Sivers, who uh, mm -hmm. I love his work as well. Um, and I came across his, him talking on a podcast about the hell yes or no concept. And I yep. read on your website, the fuck yes or no, which is way more impressive. 
Um, <laughs> I just want <laughs> way more vulgar, way more impressive. Yeah, there you go. Polarizing wins. <laughs> um, did you? Was it something that you picked up from him, or the other way around, or was it just serendipitous? That, that uh, I, I I picked it up from him. I think I link him in in the article. Oh, did you? Somewhere. Okay, I missed that because um, yeah. he wrote it. He wrote a very short and kind a of missive um, as it relates to like business decisions as he does. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And I read that and I really liked it. And then I think I was, I was still, I was talking to somebody about dating issues or whatever. You know, I started to notice that, uh, a lot of people who have problems in their relationships. They, they're kind of stuck in this gray area where it's like, they like this person, but they're not sure how mm. much they like this person. And they, maybe they'll go on another date, but they don't know how serious it is. And I kind of, I found myself just break pulling out the, the hell yes or no, or the fuck yes or no. And mm. so I wrote that article based around dating, but it's funny because actually that, that article, uh, led to a friendship between us. Um, because, it, I linked him in that article and then that it went crazy viral, like hundreds of thousands of shares. Mm. And so, and so he got this like mountain of traffic. Right. Um, and he contacted me and he was like, dude, this is awesome. Like, he's like, I'm really flattered. And then he, he started reading a bunch of my stuff and really liked it. And we started, we ended up meeting probably six months after that and, right. uh, just hit it off really well. But yeah, he's a really cool guy. Really, really nice. Yeah. And really smart, obviously. Yeah. I mean, I just, he just wrote one the other day about disconnecting. I don't know if you saw that, but that was really good. Yeah. Um, yeah. I love his stuff as well. Cause sometimes if you just want a short read, you know, that it's going to yeah. be like quick and simple, but I also made a podcast episode. We haven't become friends yet. I'm still waiting for that to happen, but, um, <laughs> I made a podcast episode about the hell yes or no. Cause it applies again, that that is anxiety. Like it's a, it's also about subtlety number three. It's about focus. Yeah. Um, and to kind of wrap all of this up, I believe that, you know, being out of alignment in our lives causes anxiety. So the closer we can get to doing things that we want to do when we want to do them with who we want to do, that means we're going to have less stress and anxiety show up. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, I would like to say thank you very much, Mark. Um, everybody should buy your book. We're going to put a link in the show notes, um, but thanks for coming on and, and, and sharing. Uh, I think we covered some great things today. Great. Yeah, it was a pleasure being here. I appreciate it. Yeah, all the best, my friend. So if you're still listening, you don't mind swearing or you just thought the content was fantastic. But either way, I'm glad that you got this far. Uh, I really enjoyed that conversation with Mark and there's some really good insights in there. Um, which I, I think we can learn a lot from a couple of things that stuck with me, a couple of the comments that Mark made, one of which was problems never go away, they get solved or upgraded. Um, and I think that's a realization which I've come to fairly recently is that there's always going to be challenges. It's about how we embrace them. And it's about, you know, essentially being grateful for, for kind of what we got at the time. Um, and his, he further extended that by saying that happiness comes from solving and improving upon our problems, not by avoiding them. A lot of stuff out there tells us to avoid our problems or to run away from them. Um, I say run towards them. So there you go. If you have any, sh and I'll probably expand on that in another episode, as I like to do, kind of extrapolate that out and, and go into a bit more detail on it. If you have any show suggestions or feedback, would like to contact me and say hi, go to the contact page at anxietypodcast.com. If you want to follow me on social media, I'm currently in Ireland at the moment enjoying the beautiful lush green grass and sights. Um, you can go and follow me, Tim JP Collins, on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out what I'm up to at the moment. And remember, until next time, less anxiety, more life. Thank you for listening to the Anxiety Podcast. For more information, go to theanxietypodcast.com.